Hello and welcome to the program. Our guest today is a best-selling author and you would all be knowing her through her books and of course through her personality. We are delighted to welcome on our program today Preeti Shinoi. Welcome to the program. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Before we get down to the actual conversation, we have a tradition on the program where we have a quote of the day. And so today I request you to do the honors and read, read a quote from one of your books. Sure. So I'd read a quote from my book, Life is What You Make It. Right. If you have not made somebody's day happier, if you have not appreciated something good that has happened to you, and if you have not felt thankful to be alive, then you have wasted that day of your life on earth. That's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And and such simple philosophy one reads throughout your nine novels now? Ninth one, yes. Yeah. And the ninth one is A Hundred Little Flames? A Hundred Little Flames. Very different from my other novels. Yeah. So very excited about it. Yeah, it, it is exciting also for um, uh, people like me who read parts of it. Uh, a lovely journey between a grandson and, and the grandfather and the, the, the emotional finding of the self through the others, isn't it? It is partly that and uh, I was on a show with Sonali Bindre the other day. She read it, she loved it huh. and she described it. The funny part is it's like this elephant mm -hmm. and uh, you know, uh, each blind person touches that part of the elephant and says that is the elephant. So she asked a very interesting question. She said for her it's a beautiful love story. Yeah. And someone else described it as a story of a young man finding himself. Mm. And yet somebody else described it as a family drama without the drama, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so each person I find, each reader I find are finding different ways to look at that book. Mm. And I'm happy because uh, the book has many layers. Yeah. It's, uh, there's many complexities which come out and I'm happy that they are finding a connection with what appeals to them the most. Mm -hmm. Which I think, uh, you know, speaks volumes about uh, what the book is all about. Mm. So, so when you approach this book or mm. when the thought um, took seed somewhere in your mind, uh, what, was, what was it that you were looking to uh, explore as a story? When I set out to write a story, I don't usually think about what am I trying to say? Uh -huh. Is this a message I'm trying to convey? It's uh, the story just flows and I construct a story and I tell a story in the best way that I can. Mm -hmm. So for this book, I remember I had, uh, you know, how the idea came to me. I had gone on a walk and uh, I came back that morning and my grandfather's diary was in my bookshelf. Mm. My grandfather used to write a diary okay. and uh, there were some pages missing. So that was an inspiration and I said, okay, what, ha what could have possibly happened that these pages are missing? And the, the, you know, I have in fact channeled my own grandfather for the ca character of mm. Gopal Shankar. Mm. I have drawn a lot from my experiences. Mm. The home that you see on that book cover. It's exactly like my ancestral home in Kerala. Okay. And around this time, I also happened to have a conversation with my mother. Mm -hmm. I speak every day on the phone to my mother. And she happened to tell me that uh, a whole lot of people in Kerala are abandoned at temples, old people. Okay. And later in the course of research for this book, I discovered it's not just in Kerala. It happens in other states in India as well. Yeah. So I said, you know, so all of this kind of came together in a story. I said there are there are so many stories which are worth listening to you know mm -hmm. old people have so many stories and they've had this whole life and I said it was very important to write such a story and the story from then on it just came to me the characters mm -hmm. the setting mm -hmm. and all of it so that that was kind of how the inspiration for this book came mm -hmm. you know it's very interesting that you say that it's it's almost like an organic process for you whether yes. it is this story or your other novels that you have written uh, a lot of authors talk about the discipline of sitting every morning from 6 a.m. to whatever the given time that they have prescribed for themselves and um, they have these days when nothing flows at all. Mm. Um, do you also face that or is it, is, does I it happen? I do think a discipline is extremely important if you are writing yeah. because there's no way otherwise you'll finish a manuscript of mm. 1 lakh words or 70,000 words mm. or whatever your novel length is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when people tell me about writer's block, 
I always feel, you know, they are making it up because <laughs> honestly, I have touch wood never experienced writer's block. You are very lucky. No, I don't think it's luck. I think it's more a process because uh, I feel if you're writing something, mm -hmm. there are a couple of ways to beat writer's block. Mm -hmm. One, I paint. So yeah. I write only when I feel like writing. And okay. uh, another a, a trick which, you know, probably people who are writers out there can use is stop in the middle of a sentence. So the next day when you're coming back to your manuscript, you just resume because you've stopped in the middle of a sentence. Then mm -hmm. it just flows. The other thing I always tell people. It's like a, it's like a conversation that um, um, you have with yourself somewhere and if you, if you stop it mid-sentence, mm. it, it leaves a lot of curiosity. I also think it's important to isolate yourself. Like right. I go go into a cave when I write right. and I really feel that thing is important. It works for me. Okay. So I don't want that external stimuli and I, do, I don't right. talk to my friends and I don't talk to people. And okay. You know, so I can, I can kind of cut off. And my friends are used to it, fortunately. Right. I have understanding right. friends. Right. And, uh, and I always feel if you have a writer's blog, Mm -hmm. For if you're not working on a novel, you want to write something, but you do you don't know what to write. Mm -hmm. They always say, you know, pretend that you're describing this setting to a blind person. You know, so you have to describe this table, this this table over there, and mm -hmm. you have to describe the person in front of you, mm -hmm. and you have written. Lo, behold, your writer's block is gone. I always feel that. You're making so it sound very easy. <laughs> But I suppose I when know, yeah. it comes to describing uh, something for mm -hmm. the blind person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one has to be very, uh, uh, one has to have great observation powers as yes. well. Yes, yes, totally, totally. So I do, I do paint a lot. Yeah. I am, uh, you know, I do portraits. So as I speak to you <laughs> in my head, I'm studying the gap between your eye and the eyebrow and, you know, the way your nose is formed. And I am, I don't do it consciously. So, so do you, do you, yeah, you're not conscious about it, but you definitely make the other person self-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, because I think, I would like to think, that it's not like I go and stare at people and say, that, oh, I'm going to sketch you, you know, it's not that way at all. So, so, th so this process of painting, is this also, I, I know that you've been writing, right? Right. From, from childhood, you were hardly eight when you wrote your book, yes. isn't it? Yes, yes. So was painting also the same uh, yes, thing? Yes, yes, because the book which I wrote, the quote, you know, book in quotes was mm. six pages long. <laughs> Four of it was story. Mm. Two pages were illustrations. So I was always painting and drawing my textbooks. The margins of it were always filled with uh, my drawings. Mm. And any story I read in my English textbook, if it if I didn't like the character which the artist had drawn, because mm. I would have imagined it some in some other way, I would draw that character <laughs> and I would go and show it to my English teacher and my English teacher was very pleased because mm -hmm. here was someone not only reading the story, also drawing huh. something related to the story. So I was always like that since childhood. So have, do, you, you, do you think you've inherited this from say your grandfather who, who wrote a diary or are there other people in your family who wrote? Or? My father used to write uh, very well, okay. but they've not had anything published. Mm -hmm. My grandfather used to write a lot of letters to me. I would okay. wait for his letter and the day I got his letter, this was of course pre-internet and pre-WhatsApp mm. and you know the day I got his letter I would reply and he was very meticulous about uh, writing and the grammar and you know leaving the margin mm -hmm. and so was my father mm. and in fact when I was expecting my uh, first child, my husband was traveling a lot so I told my father, I said uh, you have to send me a postcard every day. Because I was, I was, you know, I was feeling, you know how it is, you know, pregnant, you're, you know, feeling down and your husband is not there. So my father would write to me every day and I have those collection of postcards mm -hmm. and he would write something very interesting and a little story or a little anecdote. And my house was on the third floor and there was no lift. So every day I would climb down the stairs, go to the mailbox, take out his postcard and it was like a little ritual. And where was this? This was in Bangalore. Okay. This is in Bangalore and I would go back to the house with that treasured postcard mm -hmm. and I would read it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they have written, my grandfather, my father, they have written, You know, yes. you, you mentioned your child, of course, you're, you're a mother of two children yes. now. Yes. And they are both very proud of your writing, aren't they? Oh, yes, they are very proud, yes. But the process, when you isolate yourself, mm -hmm. like you do from your surroundings and your friends mm -hmm. and probably even your husband, uh, how, how, how do you create that... Uh, isolation with your children do they understand what it is for you because my children have grown up now <laughs> my son is uh, going to be 20 it's his birthday in a few days time okay and my daughter is 16 so right. they they are grown up now but i used to write when they were in school so i used to write when they left 
uh, you know, when they left for school. Mm -hmm. So 8.30 to 3.30, I had structured my household things in such a way that no one rings my bell, no one disturbs me. I am, you know, my maid goes off at 8.30 and then she comes back only at after 3.30 when my children return. So I get that isolated time. Mm -hmm. So when they come back, then I have to quickly switch back into the mummy mode. <laughs> so <laughs> and now that um, your children are grown up, which is hard to believe, of course, <laughs> but uh, are they also showing any kind of propensity towards writing? Uh, they are very voracious readers and mm -hmm. uh, both are, uh, you know, into art. Okay. So, and I just leave it to them, you know, I don't want them to be writers. If they want to write at some point, mm -hmm. they're most welcome to, but they do write well. Mm -hmm. And are they also um, critics of your work? They are my biggest critics <laughs> and my biggest fans. <laughs> my children and my husband. For this book, in fact, they were my early readers. Mm -hmm. So they read it and um, and it's very nice to get feedback because right. then I know it will appeal to that age group. Yeah. Because this is, you know, I was wondering whether the story where the actual hero of the book is an 80 year old, mm -hmm. would it really appeal to someone who is 20 or 18 and yeah. I can depend on my children to give me honest feedback you know this mm -hmm. like mama this is nice mm -hmm. in mama this is not nice mama this you could change this way yeah so I felt wonderful that uh, you know I felt wonderful that to get feedback from them yeah you know since we, we are talking about this ba uh, book um, of course the, the protagonist is the hero is the grandfather but also the the young boy yes so uh, this this sort of a conversation or this this sort of a delving into that relationship is something that most young kids would be able to uh, uh, understand somewhere. You know, they can identify with it. Do you keep these things in mind when you're writing? Honestly, no, because I feel uh, I cannot think of anything but my characters when I'm writing. You know, yeah. at that point, I'm not thinking, oh, will the younger uh, <coughs> generation relate? Will the older generation relate? All that comes after I finish writing and when my publishers say, okay, it's time for marketing. <laughs> and that's when I actually think of these things because when I'm writing, I'm true to the character. Yeah. I create the character and okay, Velo in this book would have spoken this way. Gopal Shankar speaks this way. So mm. if you see each character has a distinct voice and a yeah. distinct way of talking. Mm. At that time, I'm not conscious. So I'm not thinking, will it, uh, you know, will the will a younger generation relate to this? Nothing of that sort. Because when I'm creating, I'm lost in the book. What a so, wonderful state to be in, isn't it? Oh, it really <laughs> is. You know, it really is. Because you can, it's your alternate reality. It's mm -hmm. your alternate world. Mm -hmm. But it's also like someone had asked me, uh, do you miss your characters when you finish writing the book? Mm -hmm. So then I thought about it. I said, I don't miss my characters because uh, they have uh, lived inside my head for so long. Right. They, ha they are haunting me. So when I have finished the book, it's finally time to, you know, let them go. Yeah, so but it's go. like it's like family members gone on vacation, so they haven't disappeared. They're there somewhere. No, strangely, this is my ninth book. If mm. I don't let go of them, I will not be able to write my next book. Okay. So it's like when they are gone, they are in a box. They have gone mm. because then the next characters. Because only then I make way in my head for the other characters to occupy it. Mm. So it's like I guess I'm renting out my <laughs> head like a home or something <laughs> where these people come and you know stay for some time and then leave. There's such a lovely way to describe your your mind space that people come and go and they leave their impressions but they leave. They leave mm -hmm. but then it's also important to guard that mind space so which is why I don't uh, you know I don't let it be affected. Because I always tell this to people, my office is in my head. <laughs> because, you know, I don't have to physically go anywhere, but huh. it's very important to make that journey inside my head, go to that space where I don't want to go, because mm -hmm. then I draw from there to write my characters. Mm -hmm. If we go a little back to the time when you started writing, that time it was probably a, um, a cathartic um, experience for you when you started your blogging, wasn't it? It was, it was, because I had just lost my father at that time. Mm -hmm. It was in 2006. Mm -hmm. and. It was all of a sudden, mm -hmm. one moment he was, you know, w there speaking to my mother. Mm -hmm. The next moment he had passed away. And he had scheduled so many meetings and he was very active. And so it was a huge shock for all of us. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to meet me a week later. Okay. So that's when I started blogging. That's when I actually went public with my writing. Mm -hmm. So till then I was always published in college magazines or my children's school magazine and things like that. Mm. I never thought of actually going public. Mm. But in the blog, I decided, and this was started in 2000. But you know, when you say you went public, you were still anonymous. 
you you only only years. only for a very only for three months because I started my blog in October two thousand sixteen. Okay. And I started started it anonymously. Mm. So and uh, everyone wanted to see what I looked like. Yeah. <laughs> so I put a photograph of my feet. <laughs> I said they can see my feet because I was so afraid. Huh. I was afraid. And then what were you afraid of? Because it's the internet, you see, and this was in two thousand six. So, and when you are writing, you are making yourself vulnerable because you are writing about your life. Hmm. Because I always feel, as a writer, you have to have a thick skin. Right. You know, now I'm nine novels old. You can now I'm not. I'm no longer the person I was when I f- first took those hesitant steps. Mm-hmm. Because it does take a lot of courage to go public with your writing. Yeah. And then one of my blog posts they started becoming very popular. Mm. To this day, I continue blogging. And the first one was about your children. No, the first one was a very innocuous one. It was, in fact, full of grammatical errors because <laughs> my mindset was th- so at that time. Yeah. And I've left it untouched okay. because I want to see, you know, how I was then and mm. how I am now. Mm-hmm. So it's it's in fact to this day it remains free of cost, though I have been offered lakhs of rupees to. Promote and for tie up and all that, you know. Commercially, I said no. Hmm. So blog dot pratishinar dot com. You can go and read my first post. Because I feel I've come a long way. It's, so it would be I would focus on these, uh, you know, tiny moments in a day, hmm. which give you joy. Right. Because that that was what it was. Sometimes it would be a rainbow. Hmm. Sometimes it would be a little thing like a cup of tea. Because it was like this man drowning man. Uh, grappling and the man would clutch at a straw. You know, even if a mm. straw is offered to him, a drowning man will clutch. So that was my state of mind at that time in two thousand six. So it was all positive things. I said I'm not going to focus on negative things because I am in such a state and I wanted to come out of that state. And that's how it was cathartic. And in January of two thousand seven, one of my blog posts got the Perfect Post Award. Mm. So then, then it grew from then on. By the time you had become public, you had uh, put. I still hadn't pu- become public. Then huh. people wanted to see, but then by then I had found my way around. Okay. I at least had a map, and I knew the dangers and the pitfalls. Mm-hmm. And then slowly, then one some of my stuff got published in Chicken Soup for the Soul. Mm-hmm. I started writing for Reader's Digest. I wrote for Times of India, mm-hmm. and then I knew my way around. You know, and after that, slowly, uh, I put out my name. I put out my picture. Mm-hmm. And now here I am. <laughs> so we'll continue our conversation with Preeti Shanoi and all her writing and of course other things. Preeti, you know, you mentioned the fact that in your first blog, you you let it remain in step. You didn't change the grammar, no. the spelling, whatever the yes, mistakes yes. were. Now, from then to now, of course, um, you've come a long way. And we, I of course admire the fact that you are one of the few writers in today's day and age who are writing in. Very good English. The grammar is perfect. The turn of phrase is excellent. But what is it that gave you the confidence to allow yourself? You know, it's like revealing yourself if you allow something which is grammatically incorrect to be published. See, it was a personal blog, and my state of mind at that time was that, and mm-hmm. I am a huge grammar Nazi. You know, yeah. I'm very particular. <laughs> so you can imagine what a big step it was for yeah. me to take that. Yeah. So I feel it's it's it, it's, it's, it's almost like jumping off the cliff. Exactly, huh. it's a, so significant in the sense you have taken the plunge, right. and you are going to be criticized. You cannot please everybody. Mm. Even if you have written a you know Pulitzer Prize winning novel, there will be a set of people who say, ah, oh, that's nothing. Yeah. You know, it's a so I let that be because I wanted to have that courage, and it was a leap. Mm. It was a gigantic leap. Mm. You know, a one s- small step. You <laughs> for a mankind, but a giant. There, you know, as the yeah. saying goes. Yeah. So it was a big leap for me, but I have let it be because I want to. I am also a sentimentalist. I write diaries. Yeah. And okay. I write a lot. Mm. I write diaries. I write journals. I write blog posts. I write. And also poetry. I write poetry too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's. Why correct, don't yes. you read something for us? All right. Uh, recently, uh, one poem of mine was published in Condé Nast, uh, India, huh. and it's about travel. They wanted okay. me to write about travel. So this is what I wrote. Mm. The poem is called "Across the Miles." Okay. If there were no borders, no visas or passports, and if countries were not guarded like forts, if distances were traversed as easily as thoughts, if life wasn't a mass of tangled-up knots, if unraveling a thread didn't lead to mayhem, and if there was only us and there was no them, if I was. free as a bird and at will i could fly then no force would stop me in your arms i would lie 
or if I could teleport at will, I would turn up every day. We would talk face to face. You would ask me to stay. Instead, I count the days till I see you again. Each moment that ticks by brings a fresh wave of pain. We promise each other that we will meet soon. We exchange countless texts and gaze at the same moon across thousands of miles. With each other we converse, the laments we bury, the desires we nurse. And above all, two hearts thud in unison. In secret they opine, I am already yours, you are already mine. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> how Thank beautiful. You. Thank you. And we live in this wonderful universe. Um, uh, which is the, uh, the the universe of the net where there are actually no boundaries and there are no countries. Absolutely. And yes. that has been your constituency in a sense, hasn't it? I feel uh, we, live in, uh, we live in an era where boundaries have shrunk. Yeah. I have friends from UK, I have friends from uh, South America and it was strange because I had already made friends and when I went to UK, I, when I, went to, I lived there for a couple of years and when I went there, it was wonderful because uh, I had already met them. Our minds had met before yeah. our physical selves had met. So I feel it's only technology that has enabled that. And also, um, when you started writing your blogs, you got a lot more response from people in South America and other countries yes. uh, before the response started coming from India. Yes, Is strangely, <laughs> strangely. All my blogging pals were from other countries. Hmm. And so then later, Indians also you know, caught on. And also somewhere that also shows, which of course we've seen later in your novels, the universality of emotions. Yes. No matter what the setting is, the, the emotion seems to be universal, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Because see, if you, whether you're French or whether you're Japanese or whether you're Spanish or whether you're English mm -hmm. or whether you're Indian, if you have a heartbreak, it hurts the same way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, heartbreaks are always like that. If you lose a loved one, yeah. the pain is the same. Yeah. If you are jealous, the jealousy is the same. It doesn't matter what your nationality is, what you feel is the same. And uh, I feel that that's a thread which runs through my novels because yeah. anyone reading it can relate to it. Yeah. That, oh yes, I feel this because they do have a lot of feelings. Mm. So you, I want them, I want the reader to feel everything that the main character feels. Mm. So that does come across. It does come across and especially certain situations which you've taken, like you have, uh, uh, Ankita, who is bipolar. Yes. Um, so you are dealing with things like depression and, uh, of course, heartbreak, which mm -hmm. we've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, the big dilemma that most youngsters would feel in today's day and age. Um, many of these issues are there, but they're never um, addressed, either either by the person who's going through it mm -hmm. or usually dealt with by an author. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? I suppose so, because I don't know too many books where someone has dealt with uh, bipolar in a fictional setting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in uh, uh, in other books too, in this I talk about uh, schizophrenia. Yeah. So I feel these things are important and it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good thing to uh, pretend that it doesn't exist, right. like the elephant in the room, which mm -hmm. nobody wants to talk about. And I see it around me and I, when I put it in novels, it's easier for people to come back because then I get so many mails and then they tell me, we feel you have written our story. Mm. You know, so then when it comes out, then suddenly someone has said, oh, here's an elephant. And then everyone says, oh yeah, you know, I have an elephant too. Mm. So it's that. And way. it's okay to have an elephant. I think it's perfectly okay. It's yeah. important to acknowledge it and understand it and fight it before it goes into something bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment it's in a book, then it's taken seriously. I have so many young people who have written to me saying that after they read the book, they gave the book to the parent mm. and said, look, it's not something I'm making up. Mm. Because with mental health, a lot of times it so happens that just snap out of it, you know? Yeah. Depression, just snap out of it. You have everything. Why should you be depressed? But it is very real. Yeah, it is very real. Yes. And it is very physical. It's yes. not just something that, uh, that a person is hallucinating or being a hypochondriac about. No, you t and it has to be taken seriously. If someone yeah. says that, uh, you know, they, ha they are feeling a certain way, it's yeah. important to take them seriously. Yeah. So I think that comes across uh, in it my books. It yeah. comes out beautifully in that book. The other thing which I found very interesting mm -hmm. is um, the secret wish list. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. That Let's talk about that a bit. You know, one of the, uh, when you said secret wish list, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one incident which immediately came to my mind, there was my oldest reader. This was yeah. in Chennai and she was uh, 83 or 84. Right. So she came and hugged me and she <laughs> said, it's my story. 
Uh -huh. And my husband is just like uh, the husband you describe in Secret Wish List, uh -huh. but I didn't have an affair. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it was so cute, and I wanted a picture with her. Uh -huh. She was my oldest reader, uh -huh. and uh, I took a picture with her. She said, you want a picture with me? I said, yes, because I feel very happy. I took yeah. a picture with her. Yeah. Yeah. And then the same secret wish list, I launched it in Delhi. And there was this girl who had come with her mother. She was 14, huh. and she had bunked school. So I said, aren't, do, aren't you supposed to be at school? Because this event was happening at 11.30. Mm. She said, I took special permission, and I've come with my mother. Mm. And she had also read the book, and she uh. could relate to it. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised because I honestly, like I mentioned, I never think of the age group yeah. which I would appeal to. Mm. So I felt happy about that, you know. And then a whole lot of Indian housewives telling me, you have written our story. Uh. So no, what is also interesting is, is that there are enough husbands who have read the book and said, okay, is this what I'm doing to oh my yes. wife? Oh, yes. Isn't it? Yes, yes. There was this husband uh, who wrote to me and he said, uh, I always thought I was a good husband. Mm -hmm. We had an arranged marriage, a conventional mm -hmm. marriage, but the wife was happy. He lives uh, in the Middle East. Wife was happy to stay at home and take care of the children and all mm -hmm. that. And he thought that he was keeping her happy. And he says he never reads fiction. But on the flight from uh, Mumbai to Dubai, he picked up this book and he read it. Mm -hmm. And he says something in him, you know, it touched him deeply. He asked his wife, what are your desires? He loves his wife dearly. Mm. And he had never asked her before. Mm. And then she told him that I want to wear a red gown like Julia Roberts. <laughs> and then he said, I didn't even know who Julia Roberts was. <laughs> I mean, that's how out of touch they were. With and this is Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. Yes. Yeah, she looks stunning. <laughs> yes. Mm. And then later he wrote to me saying, I got her that. And he says, I can't tell you how much that book has helped. I was very touched by that email. Mm -hmm. It was such a long email. Then he'd sent his family photo. Mm -hmm. And a year later, when my next book came out, he said, I bought this. Mm -hmm. And then he again shared something. So I felt very wonderful about that. You know, I, when you're bringing about change through your writing, which which is not what you set out to do. Yes. Um, I, isn't it fantastic when, uh, when people respond in such a manner and um, they are seeing things in their lives which they probably hadn't seen before mm. and especially conversations because most of us don't seem to converse with members of the family at all. Yes. No, I'm surprised actually. I'm taken aback and mm. then I keep those mails and uh, you know on because your writer's life is a very lonely life yeah. and I wouldn't have it any other way. So on my dark writing days when I think what am I sitting here and doing, mm -hmm. I remember these mails which have made a difference. Yeah. So okay, it has made a difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Then I feel good, good mm -hmm. about it, you know. So mm -hmm. it's like my little pat on my <laughs> own back because there's no one to pat your back as writers. Mm -hmm. Except when the book comes out because the creation process is long and lengthy. Mm -hmm. So I do value such feedback and such comments, I do value them. And how do you handle the criticism when you get it? I read it over and over to ah. see if where it's coming from. So sometimes it's coming from a place of truth. Mm. Sometimes it's because they didn't like the story. They expected the story to be like this, but the story turned out mm. that way. Mm. And sometimes it's a criticism of the style. So I do take criticism very seriously. Mm. And I feel if there is something that I can learn from it, I do learn from it. But if it's something which is just negative and just written for the sake of trolling, I just discard it. But have you developed a thick skin by now? Thicker skin, I would say. <laughs> I don't know thick skin, but definitely thicker, thicker skin because I remember when my first book came out and, uh, you know, people said things. So because at first book, you don't know who's, go you are not this best-selling author. Yeah. You are just this novelist who has just put out their little precious baby mm -hmm. into the world, which is still how I feel about all my books. So at that time, you take it a lot more seriously than you do now. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm more confident because now I know my writing and I know I can do this and I've written columns in newspapers. And mm -hmm. But the first time, yeah. But now I would say, no, it doesn't bother me that much because like I said, I mentioned, I mean, I look at if there is merit in what the person is saying and I act accordingly. Mm -hmm. The other very interesting uh, thing about your books mm -hmm. um, are the titles, yeah, okay. including the first one, which was so quirky. Right. So do you think about these titles first or how does this happen? No, sometimes it uh, evolves organically. In uh -huh. fact, that is being renamed now okay. as Love a Little Stronger. So okay. that book is being relaunched mm. because that was mostly young adult, you know, mm. and now we have kind of changed it because that was creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Then there was, uh, it happens for a reason. Yeah. And the one you cannot have. Mm. 
So sometimes it comes uh, in the process of writing. Mm. Sometimes it's deliberated. You know, my publishers have a say. Mm -hmm. We talk about, oh, should this be the title or should this be the title? Sometimes it just clicks. Mm. So the process for each book is different. For this one also, a uh, hundred little flames again a very different title because uh, you know we didn't want to call it the grandfather's diary mm. or the grandfather's secret because then it sounds like some murder mystery which mm. it so is not. So a lot of thought goes into titles. Mm. The interest itself gets piqued because you read a title which is so um, so different from the ones you've read earlier or seen earlier. Isn't yes, it? yes. And then I think you also learn because this one of my books, the third novel, mm. it's called Tea for Two and a Piece of Cake. Mm. And nobody gets it right, you know. <laughs> it's like two for tea, three, three tea cups of tea, one piece of cake and you know, no one gets it right. Then I realized, huh. oh, titles shouldn't be lengthy. Huh. It should be like short, shorter titles which people can remember. Mm -hmm. Because in my head, the title is very clear. Tea for two and a piece of cake. Yeah, which, which also lends a certain intimacy. You, you know, um, when you read the title, you know that this is going to have something which is intimate. Yes. Isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. But you're right, maybe a lot of people don't get it. No, because then they, they uh, you know, they just uh, say something else instead <laughs> of the title. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, so then I realized there has to be a title which captures the character of the book. Yeah. So A Hundred Little Flames so tells it. Yes. And the last line of the book is like A Hundred Little Flames. So it's poetic. So when you read the book, you will you know, come to know why it's... Since you mentioned the uh, last sentence of the book, yes. normally people don't read, read the end of the book on a show. Right. But I'd like you to read something from the book. So I'll read a little bit from the book. I'll read the first paragraph and maybe a little bit from the eighth chapter. Okay, great. All right. When 26-year-old Ayan is sent to live with his grumpy old grandfather Gopal Shankar in a tiny village in Kerala, he is understandably devastated. What can a sleepy, idyllic village without even internet connectivity offer a young man? To make matters worse, Jayaraj, Ayan's domineering father, has his own plans and is determined to have his way. Soon, Ayan has to come to terms with the hard realities of life and the blindness of greed as he and Gopal Shankar learn that life can sometimes unravel in unanticipated ways. A young man whose life lies ahead of him, an old man whose life is all in the past and a few months that change everything. A Hundred Little Flames is a charming account of a relationship across generations as well as a meditative look at the issues of old people. Lovely. And I'll just read the first mm. Uh, first para of the first chapter. Mm. There were two completely unrelated incidents that happened on Sunday which would change Ayan's life forever. One, he attended an office party thrown by his boss in a swanky uptown pub in Pune. Two, more than a thousand miles away, in a small village in Kerala, not identifiable by Google Maps, his grandfather had a fall. Oh, so lovely. The rest of it is, you know, how are these two related? And, and the first sentence lures the reader right into the book. Yes, because how are these two related? Yeah. How, can it, how can the two even be connected? Yeah. Why does his life change mm. just because his grandfather had a fall? I'll just read a little, you know, okay. a, a tiny excerpt from page 71 because that will give you a flavor of the book right. about the kind of setting and all that. Ayan decided that he would try and look for the key to the trunk. He would also take Velu's help in getting the trunk down from the loft. He couldn't wait to get through breakfast so he could get the trunk and search for the key. Velu would be free only after breakfast. Gopal Shankar joined Ayan for breakfast. Ayan wanted to see if he, could, if he could get more information about Rohini out of Gopal Shankar. He knew better than to ask him directly. So he tried another approach. Muttasha, this Mannat Padmanabhan, did he speak well? asked Ayan. Oh yes, he was a great orator. The day he came to speak, I remember going to Joseph's shop as my father had asked me to buy shaving blades for him. He wanted seven o'clock slotted blades, double-edged. <laughs> there were seven annas for a packet of ten. When I got back home after listening to Mannat Padbanavan, the first thing my father asked me was, did you get the shaving blades? <laughs> Fortunately, I had. Joseph and I still laugh about it, said Gopal Shankar. This is so beautiful and so endearing yes. and so real because yes. these are conversations that happen in almost every household. Yes, isn't yes. It? because he has gone to listen to this great orator, uh -huh. Manat Padmanabhan, which yeah. was very famous at yeah. that time because yeah. it was in the 50s. Uh -huh. and when he comes home, his first father asks us, did you get the shaving blades, <laughs> you know? We are in conversation with Preeti Shanoi and her wonderful world of books.
Preeti, you know, one of the things uh, that is said about you is that you are, of course, a best-selling author. But they always mention the fact that you are the woman best-selling author, you know. How do you react to that? Because I, I get bristled when I read something like that. <laughs> you know, yesterday <laughs> a journalist asked me a question. And he said, uh, you know, he said, how do you balance uh, home life and your writing career? Huh. So I asked him, will you ask a man the same question? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I guess it's that, um, I guess uh, the reason why people do that is uh, the best sellers today are dominated by men. Mm. And so they feel good. So I don't think they mean it to annoy or... Yeah, but if, if instead of Preeti, your name, if you write under a pseudonym, your no novels would still be best sellers, wouldn't they? Except then people would probably say, how, how, how come this guy knows so much of About the mindscape of a woman or any any mindscape? Uh, I don't take, uh, you know, uh, probably they would be, probably they wouldn't be. But if you s notice, even J.K. Rowling didn't reveal, uh, you know, they, yeah. she named it J.K. Rowling. Yeah, she, she didn't give her first name because they didn't want people to think it's a woman. Huh. But I honestly don't know if people are actually looking at her book. Hmm. And I would, it would be very uh, surprising to me if I knew that people are looking at the gender of the writer and then picking up the book. Uh -huh. So honestly, I don't know and I wear it like every other label. Hmm. So then they ask me, how does it feel to be on the Forbes list? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I still have to wake up in the morning. I have to make my breakfast, I have to take my dog and I have to feed her and all of that. Huh. So these are just things which people say, which... Uh, but what do you, did you, when you set off, did you think this was a male bastion and you had to kind of uh, conquer it in some way? I was, I just wanted to get published, <laughs> you know, forget male bastion. Huh. I would be very grateful if somebody published me. So huh. I never thought of it that way at all. Huh. But now when I think of it, yeah, it is true. What they are saying is true, but I had not really thought of it. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that at least there's one woman out there, you <laughs> know, honestly. And also the writing is totally different. Probably that is why people... Uh, kind of make that remark. You know, I was so happy that you noticed it. <laughs> I was so happy that you actually said it because gram grammar and because I'm so finicky about it. Yeah. Because sometimes I do feel that there are a whole lot of books out there which mm. are poorly written. And they are bestsellers. They are bestsellers. So yeah. it's, they are poorly written. So it's, it's almost as though bestselling means bad writing, which yeah. is not guys. Yeah. <laughs> no, please read my book and you have said it. So yeah. it's, uh, so I do feel it's very important to write well, hmm. to have that depth. See, they might be easy reads, but they still have to be written well. Exactly. If they're not written well, I cannot read them. Even if they're bestsellers, I can't read them. Yeah. So this you know, brings me to this next question. There are bestsellers which are not necessarily well written. Some of them have good content. Some of them don't even have good content, but they are bestsellers. Have you for yourself figured out what is the formula for you that works? to create a book which is a bestseller? Uh, I don't think there's any formula. Uh -huh. I really don't think there's any formula and I don't believe in formulas, which is why each of my books is different from the other. Hmm. See, I have dealt about bipolar disorder, about, uh, you know, making a wish list. Hmm. Can you, can it really come true when you make a wish list? And uh, single mother who's had a child out of wedlock, yeah. unrequited love, hmm. and this one again explores a different thing. So if yeah. there was a formula, it would be very easy for me. Mm. All I had to do was churn out a book, mm. which is exactly like the other books. You read one book of mine, you read them all. And I hate to do that. Mm. So with each book, I do something different, which is why I was pretty nervous about this book mm. because I said, okay, will it, you know, even though I have written so many books, will this actually reach the bestseller list? Because mm. who will want to read about an 80-year-old protagonist? Yeah. This morning, my publishers called me up and it was this huge sigh of relief because they said it has stopped the Nielsen list. Oh, I was like, thank God, you know, because I was very nervous till I heard that. Mm -hmm. Because you never know, right? So if you are safe, if you follow a formula, mm -hmm. but I don't like to be safe. <laughs> so do you keep these things in mind? I'm not following, uh, I'm not repeating myself, that is for certain. Mm -hmm. And also I'm ensuring that I don't write the kind of stuff other people are writing. I don't want to write this kind of stuff which other people are writing. So, so or is this an organic process or do you really, are you deliberate about it? I am not deliberate about it. But yeah. then the thing is, if it is a girl meets boy story and, you know, it doesn't interest me to write mm -hmm. that. And I should be interested. I should be enthused about writing it because mm -hmm. I'm not just writing anything for the sake of writing. Mm -hmm. I should be in love with my characters, you know. Mm -hmm. it's That's very important to me. 
So if it's that normal, ordinary thing, it doesn't appeal to me. And in fact, my short stories are very dark. Hmm. They're completely different from my novels. Hmm. At some point, they will be out in a book. Yeah. Right now, they're out in the electronic form hmm. on various platforms. So I like to do different things as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to grow because if you're writing the same thing, you know, it becomes a very uh, tedious process. It does, boredom, doesn't it? Boredom sits in and I get bored very easily. So <laughs> <laughs> which is tough for a writer because if, if you get bored, how do you continue? Yes, which is why my books are very different. Yeah. From and you know, you mentioned dabbling in different things. You've talked about painting early in the program, how you've been doing that kind of stuff but you also are uh, an avid yoga practitioner aren't yes, you? Yes, yes, big time. Okay, so uh, is this something you've been doing from um, childhood or have yes. you picked it up? No, from childhood because I used to always be the one picked up for yoga demos. Yoga was a subject in our school. Mm -hmm. I went to Kendri Vidyalayas. Huh. So yoga was a subject. So we had this uh, yoga teacher who was excellent and huh. I went to Kendri Vidyalaya IIT Chennai. So we would go for yoga demonstrations where he would give the lecture hmm. and there would be handful picked for demonstrating the asanas. And you did Ashtanga yoga? I did Ashtanga recently. Okay. But at that time I did normal yoga and we would demonstrate. And hmm. Ashtanga I feel grounds you. You know, nothing affects you. Hmm. So whether it's success, whether it's failure, hmm. it doesn't affect you. It just teaches you to deal with it in an amazing way. Hmm. It just totally like, you know, nothing, nothing really... Uh, you know, I've done yoga for so many years, but I never got that mental strength which Ashtanga has given me. Mm. So I continue practicing it to this day. Mm. That was in the last two years, in fact, Ashtanga. But isn't that in contradiction with writing? Because you have to be so passionate and you have to feel something so deeply that it has to um, kind of express itself in writing. Yes, so when you're writing, it's a different thought, thought process, you're allowing it. When I say nothing affects you, I mean the external things. Right. Because like I mentioned, my mind is like, you know, like an office, so you have mm. to guard it. Mm. So Ashtanga Yoga is that guard. So that the inside area is accessible only to me, you know, so mm. I can go as deep as I want as this thing and there I am in control. Mm. But when it is external circumstances, say you're stuck in traffic, Mm. or your bo boss is rude to you or someone has yelled at you unfairly mm. or your children have made some demands on you which are unreasonable mm. or your maid hasn't turned up <laughs> is what I can think of. Huh. Such things don't affect you because you learn to look at it in a big picture. But when you're writing, it's a different part of my brain, you know, mm. where I f delve deeply into the characters and I feel everything that the character is feeling. So it doesn't mean that you don't feel anything, you know, you don't suddenly <laughs> become a saint and yeah. that would be, that would be a horrible way of leaving, I would imagine. Yeah, I suppose so. Yes, yes. But also, um, you know, somewhere it, it strengthens you spiritually, doesn't it? That is exactly what I was trying to say. It strengthens one spiritually, mm -hmm. totally. And uh, I think it's very important to have that calm space. Hmm. So. And then you can find uh, that, that calm space just about anywhere. If you're traveling somewhere, you can just... Um, you know, go inwards and there is that calm space. You don't have to uh, assign calm space time for yourself. Absolutely. And for me, especially now, I'm traveling a lot. Hmm. This book, the cover was launched in Birmingham. Okay. And the book itself was launched in Sharjah. Hmm. So you can imagine the kind of travel through hmm. time zones. Hmm. So yoga was one thing which I found helped, you know, helped me to uh, kind of, uh, you know, say a meditate, it's kind of a meditative experience, even yeah. though Ashtanga is quite, uh, I mean, it doesn't so well so much on the, you know, sitting calmly. But when you are doing the asanas and when you are in those still poses, you are actually calming your mind. Mm -hmm. So I feel that helps. And that's somewhere, I suppose, in your case, helps with the creative process. You know, to be honest, sometimes <laughs> I would find it difficult <laughs> because when I'm doing this pose in Ashtanga, uh -huh. my characters are playing inside my head uh -huh. and you have to be very focused because with each movement, there's a particular breath. Uh -huh. And then I would realize that, oh, I have lost concentration and it's very hard because <laughs> Ashtanga, you have to be very focused. Uh -huh. So sometimes I would dream and then my guru would come and say, uh, you know, you've done something wrong and then they were like oh my god okay, okay I better pay attention so your characters are busy teasing you and yes uh -huh. yes because you have to be <laughs> in the moment yeah so that's how it is you know there is uh, one question which I'd like to ask you which I'm sure a lot of people do mm, the general myth is that an author uh, writes characters which are sort of autobiographical mm. or does that happen with you 
in fa one of my characters in one book is exactly like me which is in it happens for a reason mm. we mm. exactly like me we talks like me we sits like me we thinks like me it was very easy to create we because all i had to do was you know think what will i do in that situation yeah but my other characters are not like me at all they no, are not no not necessarily like you uh -huh. but the experience of life are in that sense autobiographical i think we all draw from our real life experiences something that happened to you something that happened to your friends something that affected you mm -hmm. something that like all writers i do borrow from real life mm -hmm. So yeah I think th I think you do because that's how you write. Yeah but a lot of it is vicarious isn't it? Uh lot of it is imaginary <laughs> and yeah um. imaginary yeah is it vicarious I don't know but it's imaginary for sure. So do your friends and relatives and uncles and aunts um recognize themselves in your characters? No, you know what my <laughs> mom's sister whom I'm very close to, she hasn't yet read this book. Mm. And uh, my mom has read the book. She's always my first reader and she called her up she said, "Are we in the book?" <laughs> my mother <laughs> said, "Sadly, we are not in the book." <laughs> <laughs> so they are actually happy to recognize them from sometimes it so happens that mm. I wouldn't have written about a person, mm. but the person will think that it's about them. So then, you know, it it happens but they are usually flattered because yeah. I don't make them out to be these cruel monsters and I think it largely also depends on how people see themselves. Yeah. So if if someone is very cruel then that actual cruel person whom I based it on won't recognize that he's actually cruel, you know. That's a fantastic <laughs> trick, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it deliberately. This is just yeah. how the human mind works. Mm. So now that this book is out and you put these characters out of your mind, what are you working on now? Oh, the next book because I have a two book deal with Westland. Okay. <laughs> So I mean I can't yet talk about it uh -huh. contractual obligations but uh, it's an and it's another fictional novel so okay. I can tell you that and when do we expect that uh, next year next because year. almost every year I've had a book release mm -hmm. and I've just finished this you know so so this is fantastic and we do pray that you never have uh, the writer's block and you keep writing as prolifically as you are at the moment Thank Preeti, you. Thank you so much for being on our program. Oh thank you very much it was a pleasure talking to you. I do hope you enjoyed our program. If you have any comments or suggestions, do write into us at this email ID, atsavere at ddkdelhi.org.in. With that, we take leave on this program. Until next time, then, goodbye.